Okay, here's the um, a bit of a talk through of the solutions to the test prep you've just done uh, for the upcoming test in statistics. The first question is uh, looking at a, um, a survey that's being taken place and you've got the data about the different splits within that population. So you've got 10,800 females and 9,200 males um, and they're looking at doing a survey of 500 people. So what kind of survey would be best? Well, you need to talk about the fact that you've got different characteristics within that population. We've got more females than males, so therefore in a survey, your survey size and your survey design has got to represent the population. Otherwise, you'll get a biased result. So stratified sample will take into account the characteristics of the population, and taking the characteristics of the population means that your sample is going to be representative of the population. So how many, male, how many females would you need? Well, you get the number of females, which is 10,800, divided by the, number, the total population there, and times it by your sample size, which you've been given. So that gives you 270 females. Remembering that this has to be a full number, and it's just this one's worked out at 270, so that's what you need. So this is how you work out a stratified sample, the calculations of it. The next part says, OK, <clears throat> Mr. Bentley talked about a survey and he surveyed 30 people, then you went and did exactly the same thing and surveyed 30 people, but your averages are different. He had an average of 30 and you had an average of 47. And it means, what it means is the sample size can't be big enough because there's not enough, the, the variation in the mean is huge. Um, remembering that when you're trying to do a sample, your sample mean should be reflective of the population mean. Now here your sample means are completely different so therefore your sample is not big enough to represent the population mean and it shows that there's bias because you obviously haven't interviewed the same 30 people or the same 30 people that have the same characteristics as each other so um, the sample needs to be bigger to get around that so they suggested um, a sample of 500 um, out of that population of 20,000 and is that what you would do? So you need to do that square root of, square root of n uh, add 10% of n and that will give you a approximate population or approximate sample size from your population. So if you go square, through, square root of 20,000 you get 141,000 and then 10% of 20,000 is 2,000 add the two together and you get 2,142. So is his selection of 500 right? No it's not. It's way too short. It's way too small. So he needs to have at least 2,142 people there. Okay, so it's just a measure, it's just a guide that that's how many you should have, but that's kind of what we're using here. Um, Mr. Bentley says, okay, what we'll do is we'll do the survey inside the uh, local hardware magazine, because he's trying to find out whether people want to come to his hardware shop. Um, and it would cause bias because the people that are reading the magazine are the ones that want to go to a shop. So, of course, they're going to be in favour of uh, the development and those kind of things. The reason for it is that not every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. And remember that's the definition of uh, a random sample. A random sample is when every member has an equal chance of being selected. So when that doesn't occur, there's a chance that bias is going to come into your um, results. So this would cause bias in your results as not every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. So I've just recapped the, um, the definition of random sample. This next one here is entering data into the calculator. Class A will be list 1 on your calculator, class B will be list 2 on your calculator. Put them in there and then you'll get your five number summaries. Five number summaries is your minimum, your quartile 1, your median, quartile 3 and your maximum which then you use for your box plot and you get um, these numbers here. So now the next part is are there any outliers and is it reasonable to remove them? So what I've done is I've looked at B, class B, because I can see that um, there's a massive range there. And we're going to use the formula of 1.5 times the interquartile range. The interquartile range is Q3 take away Q1. So I'm looking at class B here. So my Q3 is 78 and my Q1 is 57. So therefore, 21 is that number. So then we grab that 21 and we times it by 1.5. So 1.5 times 21 gives me 31.5. So we are now saying that any piece of data that falls 31.5 away from the lower quartile or above the upper quartile is so far away from the data that it's probably not worth using. So let's look at the top end. 
Our top end is 78 is our upper quartile, so from here. We add 31.5 and it gives us 109.5. So is there anything above 109.5? And we look at our data and we say no there isn't, because we can see that um, the highest number is 100. So let's go to the other end here. 57 is our lower quartile. Take 31.5, which we worked out from our calculation, gives us 25.5. So anything below 25.5 we can get rid of. So when you have a look at your data, we've obviously got this number here. This number here is below 25.5. And when you look at your box plot, they are way away from everything else. So it does make sense to get rid of them and uh, delete them out of the picture. Okay, so the question says, you know, are there any? And we go, yep, there are 1 in 13, which we can take away from. So now remove the outlier, or the outliers in this case, and see how it's affected the mean. The mean's gone up from 71.4 to 67.1. Notice how the, the mean changes. The median is now, was, is now 70, and it was 70, so it hasn't changed much. And the, the range has changed from 51 to 99. Okay, the, the sample is better now because it's more representative of the whole class because if you have a look at all the other numbers, all the other numbers are 49 onwards. Um, so these 13, oh, that number 13, that number 1, are so far away from them that it makes it very hard to actually make um, a good judgment of what's going on in the class. So you could probably get rid of them. Also, the reason for them being there, you might have had kids that have been away or sick and therefore they come back in and they get given a test, they have no idea what's going on um, and they are way away from everyone else, so it's probably reasonable for pulling them out. In a test or something like that, you'll get told to remove them. Now, here's a, a box plot. This should be done with a ruler. I couldn't do use a ruler on, a, on this uh, program that I'm using. So, notice that I've got a box plot, I've got a scale, and then I've drawn for class A and class B and I've also put in the values there. Okay, now if you've drawn class B coming all the way down here um, with the outlier, then you're not going to get that mark because of the fact that it says with the outlier removed. So if that line there is, is in there for you because um, you forgot to take the outlier out, then you're not going to get the marks. It must have a title. You've got to have a title, otherwise it's not going to work for you or you're not going to get marks. Then um, draw back-to-back -back stem and leaf. So I've done that. Notice I've just left the 1 and 3 there just to see what it's like. If I wasn't taking that into account, my, my bell shape curve is going to look like this. Okay, um, And you can see that uh, these are the numbers lying in there, so it's actually not too bad. Um, when it talks about the shape, class A is bimodal because it's got these two peaks here, two modes. Um, and class B is, is slightly negatively skewed. If you take into account the outlier is still being there, it's quite negatively skewed, otherwise it's just been pushed up. So the school principal says, okay, both the averages are the same, so therefore the classes must be the same. Even though the means are close, what's happened is you've got um, quite a few students in class A on a lower percentage, and in class B has a higher percentage. So what happens is you've got the, the higher percentages in class B here, in class A here, sorry, pulling out the marks, but you've still got a whole chunk of kids here who are failing the test if your pass mark is 50%. So if your 50% is here, you've got all these kids failing. And then the last question is, which one would you get someone to help out in, like a teacher, a teacher aide or an SSO to come and help out in that class? Well, you'd be looking at class A because you've got a whole chunk of these kids are failing. So if you have a look, and even if you have to go back and look at your box plot, um, you've got, if your 50% mark here is here, you've got all these kids from that way down failing, which is a massive amount, whereas here you've only got one kid in class B. So what you're wanting to do in class A is pull all these kids up across that 50% mark. Class B seems to be performing quite well once you've taken those outliers out. Okay, just note of how many marks something's out of, um, because then you can kind of gives you an indication about how many points you need to make in your comments. Alright, so that's how uh, that first test revision works.